99% of the air we breathe is made up of nitrogen and oxygen. But that other 1% is a complex and delicate mixture of gases. It's mostly argon, but it contains traces of carbon dioxide, ozone and other noble gases, each playing their part in the complex chemistry of our atmosphere. However, floating all around us too, far too small to see, are molecules and particles born from fire, from engines, stoves and chimneys. Combustion releases more than just heat. It releases pollutants. Carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, unburnt hydrocarbons and fine particulates. This is the story of fire and pollution and the hidden chemistry shaping the world above us. When we talk about air pollution, we often think of busy roads and factory chimneys. But some of that pollution can travel very large distances and have dramatic effects on all of us. So we need to understand where it comes from and what it does to us and to the planet. In search of those answers, we begin with something incredibly familiar, fire. When you burn a fuel, let's say a hydrocarbon like methane, you're watching a chemical reaction called combustion. In its perfect form, combustion is quite tidy. For example, here CH4 plus 2O2 goes to CO2 plus 2H2O. We call this complete combustion. And it happens when there's plenty of oxygen. The carbon in the fuel bonds with the oxygen in the air to form carbon dioxide, and the hydrogen reacts with the oxygen to form water vapour. It's clean and it's efficient. But here's the problem. In the real world, combustion is almost never complete. Engines, stoves or power stations, they all struggle to burn fuel perfectly. And when combustion is incomplete, things get messy. Incomplete combustion leads to a cocktail of pollutants, not just carbon dioxide and water, but also carbon monoxide, unburnt hydrocarbons, and tiny little particles of carbon known as carbon particulates. If I set my Bunsen here to the yellow safety flame, I'm doing so by restricting the amount of oxygen that can get into the stream of gas. And so I change a very efficient reaction of almost complete combustion into a much less efficient one. The flame is safe in the sense that I can see it and so hopefully I'm not going to burn myself on it. But in reality, it's pumping out a mixture of carbon monoxide, carbon particulates, and even unburned parts of hydrocarbon into the air. And it's mainly the carbon particulates which are actually glowing and giving the flame its orange colour, in case you ever wondered about that. Now, if I hold this pottery shard over the flame, you'll see that it very, very quickly will start to blacken. It isn't burning. All it's doing is collecting those carbon particulates on its surface, and it's showing us, in reality, the extent of the problem. These particulates are tiny, often smaller than the width of a human hair. But don't let their size fool you. Along with their invisible partner, carbon monoxide, they can be some of the most harmful pollutants in our atmosphere. Carbon monoxide is often called a silent killer. It's colourless, odourless, and it bonds with the haemoglobin in your blood more strongly than oxygen does. In fact, once carbon monoxide has bonded to the haemoglobin in a red blood cell, that cell can no longer do its job of carrying oxygen around your body. 
And that means your body will not be getting enough oxygen. Even small amounts can cause dizziness, headaches, nausea, breathlessness, loss of consciousness, and in extreme cases, death. It's why carbon monoxide alarms are essential wherever there is gas, wood or coal-fired heating. You won't see it, you won't smell it, and the symptoms can quickly overpower you, so you need to be aware. There is one warning sign, and it's actually the other major product of incomplete combustion. It's those carbon particulates. They will collect on surfaces such as the outside of your boiler, leaving yellow, brown or black sooty marks. If you see those marks building up on your boiler, it's very important to get it serviced by a qualified professional tradesperson. Those carbon particulates don't just land on surfaces near to the site of combustion. They can travel vast distances in the air, and they too can cause real problems. They could be breathed in, lodging deep in our lungs, and they have been linked to breathing problems such as asthma and even cancer. Some of those particles can be incredibly small indeed, smaller than 2.5 micrometres, and that's a diameter small enough to enter your bloodstream. There, they can travel to your heart, your brain, or other key organs. We're not sure about the long-term consequences of those particles yet, but it's safe to say they are best avoided. We often think of pollution as a local problem, something that affects our towns and cities and us when we're there, but actually some of its effects stretch far beyond what we can see. One of them is called global dimming. Global dimming is the idea that the amount of sunlight reaching Earth's surface is less today than it was, say, a hundred years ago. In the late 20th century, scientists started noticing that sunlight levels were dropping by as much as 10% in some regions. These graphs here show the dimming of the Earth's surface. Notice those dips particularly in the 1970s, 80s and 90s, when air pollution wasn't given the attention it deserved. The problem comes when those particles reach the upper atmosphere, where they can scatter and reflect sunlight back into space. Now, less light, of course, means less energy available for photosynthesis in plants, and so it's certainly something we want to avoid. But actually, the relationship of those particles to global temperature might be a bit more complex. It's a strange twist, but the burning of fuels which release the greenhouse gases that are warming our planet might also be releasing those particles which might block the sunlight and cool us down. Environmental chemistry is a tricky business, but one that is critical to our future. If we are going to control pollution, we must first understand it and the sources of those unwanted extras in our atmosphere. We know they largely come from burning fossil fuels, petrol, diesel, coal and gas, but even wood can be a major source of those pollutants. In the UK, vehicles are a big culprit, and that's why there's such a push for cleaner transport. Electric cars, low emission zones, and public transport powered by renewable energy all do their bit. But do remember that for an electric vehicle to be better for us on a global scale, the electricity that runs them must be generated from a green source such as solar, wind or hydroelectric power. The solution lies in rethinking how we power our world. Cleaner fuels, better engines that burn fuel more efficiently and ultimately reducing our reliance on combustion altogether. So, air pollution might have seemed like an abstract problem, but it's actually a deeply personal one, because with every breath we take, 
we're connected to the chemistry of our atmosphere and understanding it, how it works and how it goes wrong is really the first step to building a cleaner, healthier future. Because once we know what's in the air, well, we can set out to change it. So whether you're a scientist of the future, building a safer world for us all, or a campaigner canvassing support for change at a government level, you now have the knowledge to build that better, brighter world. Until next time.